Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the International Economic Development Council's Keeping Up with Both Sides of the NAFTA Debate and its Impacts on the Global Economy webinar. My name is Paul Zito. I'm Vice President of International Development at RGP Northwest Ohio, which is a privately funded economic development agency for the Toledo area and 20 surrounding counties. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Joining us today are five true experts on NAFTA issues who will share insight into NAFTA's economic development impacts. We would all like to thank the organization and support of the IEDC, along with its International Advisory Committee for putting this webinar together. And special thanks to Delaney Luna and Swati Ghosh of IEDC who were instrumental in putting this webinar together. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few organizational and housekeeping notes from IEDC. Please note that all attendees will be muted during the webinar. To ask a question of the speakers, please type your questions into the question box. During the Q&A period at the end of the session, I will present your questions to the panelists. And finally, within 24 hours of today's webinar, an evaluation will be mailed to you by IEDC. Please complete the evaluation as we do use the feedback to improve our web seminars. At the end of the evaluation, you will receive a link to download all of today's presentations. Now, I am not a NAFTA expert. However, I am a NAFTA practitioner. I've been doing international sales for 30 years and promoting foreign investment primarily into the US for the past 22 years. And I do have some views on NAFTA and tariffs that I'd like to share with you to kick things off. Some things I've dug up and that hit me as interesting. Uh, firstly, since NAFTA began in 1994, trade with Canada and Mexico has increased over 350% to a value of $1.2 trillion. And about one third of US merchandise exports go to Canada and Mexico. A panelist and I were discussing a few minutes ago that quite often NAFTA discussion is ruled by emotions and not by data and facts and what actually happens to the people and businesses of Canada, Mexico, and the US. In addition, uh, for agriculture, exports to Canada from the US have trebled and to Mexico have quintupled since the inception of NAFTA, and one in every 10 acres of farmland in the United States is used for exports to Canada and Mexico. In terms of services, U.S. services exports to Canada and Mexico have more than trebled from $27 billion in 1993 to nearly $100 billion now. In addition, according to CAR, the Center for Automotive Research, those, auto, those automobiles that are imported into the U.S. actually contain between 20 to 40 percent of U.S. content. Prior to NAFTA, those automobiles imported from Mexico only had about 5 percent U.S. content. That speaks volumes right there. And then my final comment in my experience of helping companies around the world do business in other countries. Generally, when a U.S. company opens up an operation in Canada or Mexico or China or Brazil or anywhere else in the world, it is not to have cheap labor and to import cheap goods into the US, but rather to service those markets, Canada, Mexico, wherever they do set up operations. Anyway, some food for thought to kick this off. I would like to now introduce today's speakers, beginning with Douglas George. Consul General of Canada in Detroit. He is a career diplomat with over 30 years of experience and most recently served as Canada's ambassador to Kuwait. He is recognized as a trade policy expert and has worked on GATT issues, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades. He's worked on European Union issues during an assignment in Brussels with the Canadian Mission to the EU, and he's worked on World Trade Organization issues and has served in a number of locations around the world for the Government of Canada. Doug, we are very glad to have you here today. Without further delay, I'll turn this over to you. 
Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. I also want to thank uh, the team at IEDC for organizing this webinar. It's an honor to be uh, on this panel with such a, an esteemed group of uh, experts. As Canada's Consul General to Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and Michigan, I'm eager to share Canada's goals on updating NAFTA. I'm equally interested to hear perspectives from Mexico and to hear how professionals in the economic development community are adapting during this period of renegotiation. My goal in the next 10 minutes is to share with you the great potential for significant benefits we can achieve if we can renegotiate a modernized NAFTA. I'd also like to spend some time on a very topical issue, the US tariffs under Section 232 and the countermeasures that Canada has announced. First, I'd like to begin with a brief overview of the success of the tri-national Canada-US-Mexican economy under NAFTA. Paul gave a bit of an introduction as well. Let me say at the outset, there was a perception that NAFTA is being renegotiated because it isn't working. Quite the opposite. NAFTA has created a productive trade and investment region that has a proven record of benefiting all three countries. As North Americans, we enjoy a mutual prosperity we should not take for granted. Our long-standing continental cooperation has made North America one of the largest and most integrated economic zones in the world. And the scale of this economic relationship is outstanding. Continent-wide, our three nations produce a combined GDP of $21 trillion and serve 480 million consumers. And NAFTA's track record is one of economic growth and middle-class job creation throughout the continent. Annual trilateral trade, as Paul noted, is well over a trillion dollars, three times what it was in 1993. And trade between NAFTA members is now estimated to exceed $100 million per hour. Our highly intertwined cross-border firms and integrated supply chains make North America the most competitive zone in the global economy. But let's put it in a in a global context. The combined population of our three countries is slightly less than 7% of the world's population, yet together we account for more than one quarter of the world's GDP. And it's the system of rules-based trade that is largely responsible for our mutual economic prosperity. Let me talk a little bit about Canada-Mexico. We always talk about our relationship with the US. Let me look a bit farther south. Mexico is one of Canada's most important economic relationships as it is our third largest trading partner. And fostered by NAFTA, the bilateral merchandise trade was over $43 billion Canadian in 2017. Bilateral trade has grown at an astonishing 855% since the inception of NAFTA and just over the last five years by over 34%. And Canadian direct investment in Mexico is growing, especially in the auto parts supply sector. People, families, and businesses all throughout the continent have livelihoods that depend on the success of our economic partnership. Close to 14 million jobs in the U.S. depend on NAFTA. Nine million are supported by trade and investment with Canada. Another five million by trade and investment with the U.S. Integration and cooperation are hallmarks of our trilateral economic partnership and have brought significant gains to companies operating throughout the North American zone. And we don't just simply sell things to each other. We build things together and export to the rest of the world. In the case of Canada-US integration, our manufacturing sectors are so seamlessly connected that on average, Canadian exports of manufacturing goods to the US contain 25% US content. This integration generates cost savings and increases productivity. The result is that our North American products are more competitive in places like China and Western Europe. We must work together to preserve and expand our partnership because when we do, we are all made stronger and more prosperous. I preface my remarks on Canada's approach to NAFTA by affirming that Canada has long recognized that free trade is good for our economy. In fact, we're a nation of traders. We rely on international commerce for affordable products at home and expanded markets abroad. While NAFTA is being greatly beneficial, many things can be done to bring the agreement into the 21st century. Since NAFTA came into force, the world has changed. 
our work, our economies, the cars we drive, our day-to-day -day lives have all evolved. We can update NAFTA not only to reflect changes of the past 24 years, but we also have to think of making it to modernize it in anticipation of what might be happening in the future. We need to be forward-looking. These negotiations officially, <coughs> excuse me, launched, excuse me, negotiations were officially launched last August, and they're very expansive in scope. We have hundreds of negotiators meeting in more than two dozen different groups. Canada is at the table. We're presenting ideas and solutions that benefit all three NAFTA partners and contribute to North American competitiveness. We've closed a lot of chapters, made incredible progress on other chapters, and we're close. But we still have some work ahead of us, and Canada believes that a fair agreement that benefits all three partners is possible. And we're working tirelessly to achieve this. And I'll quote Vice President Pence. He says what we need to do is find a win-win-win agreement where all three countries can point to what is benefiting their country. Now, uh, my post covers a lot of uh, states that are major producers of autos. So I thought I'd spend just a minute on the auto rules of origin in NAFTA. And this is an incredibly complicated issue. It's very important to get the details right as they will affect investment decisions for years and decades to come. Now, the U.S. went in wanting to create an incentive <coughs> for auto production so that this production and sourcing would remain in North America. And in their case, they were aiming to keep it in the U.S. in particular. As an experienced trade negotiator, I can understand where they were coming from. But given the dynamics of the industry, we need to be careful how we approach this. The increased cost of meeting new requirements could drive production overseas, possibly losing North American jobs forever. So we're working, <coughs> excuse my, excuse my coughing, toward an outcome that would reduce red tape, improve enforcement, and increase the use of North American steel and aluminum, as well as incentivizing investment in manufacturing, research and development in North America. Uh, the team used to work for me, the Rules of Origin team, I know that they're very imaginative and can come up with great ideas. But what we're in essence doing, and this is just one example, is working on solutions to modernize the rules in a way that allow us to remain globally competitive while also promoting growth and innovation in the sector. From the outset of these talks, Canada's approach has been to propose ideas and solutions that are gonna benefit businesses and workers in all three of our countries and we remain completely committed to this goal. In the NAFTA negotiations on investment, the U.S. has been public about its preference to opt out of an investor state dispute mechanism. Now, investor state is pretty important in economic development, and Canada considers it important that we retain these protections. We can tweak them based on our experience, but it's important to retain these protections. We're also seeking clear, predictable, and progressive rules that recognize the legitimate right of governments to regulate in the public interest. Other elements of our trade agenda support economic growth while seeking to ensure the benefits from trade are shared more broadly and equitably. These include more effectively promoting labor rights, strengthening environmental protections, and emphasizing that we are creating economic opportunities for all segments of society. Now, um, I would be remiss if I didn't turn to section 232, which is, uh, you may have noticed, been in the news quite a bit recently. Canada views the section 232 tariffs recently imposed by the U.S. as completely separate from the NAFTA negotiations. But I will address them because um, it's important in our bilateral trading relationship. If you haven't been following it, the U.S. imposed tariffs on steel and aluminum from Canada Mexico and the EU under Section 232, claiming the false pretext of national security. There are also a number of other countries uh, who have been hit as well. Now, let's talk about the idea of national security as the reason for putting these in place. 
Canada is fundamental to US national security. We fought together in two world wars, Korea, Afghanistan, and are currently uh, fighting together against Daesh, ISIS in Iraq. Canada and the US are longstanding partners and allies. Our industries and governments work together to address common challenges. We're staunch allies in NORAD, we're dependable partners in NATO, and our agencies work together all along our peaceful, secure, undefended border that spans over 5,500 miles. As shown in the slide, the US is running a, a trade surplus in steel with Canada. In response to these measures, uh, Canada announced last week that we intend to impose tariffs on imports of steel, aluminum, and other products from the US. We are imposing dollar for dollar tariffs. So for every dollar levied against Canadian goods by the US, we will respond with reciprocal measure. But let me emphasize, this is not about the American people. Americans remain our friends, allies, and partners. As our prime minister said of the US administration, we have to believe at some point that common sense will prevail. Now, um, when we talk about trade, we also have to talk a little bit about the infrastructure. And while we're talking about trade and investment, I would be remiss if I didn't conclude my presentation without mentioning a once in a generation infrastructure project that will provide much needed transportation improvements for international travels, travelers and North American commerce. The new Gordie Howe International Bridge will connect Detroit, Michigan and Windsor, Ontario and will accelerate the flow of goods and services at the busiest commercial border crossing between Canada and the United States. 30% of Canada US goods trade crosses at this place. The project is going to be delivered through a public-private partnership and the partner will design, build, operate, finance and maintain the bridge. I'm pleased uh, to announce to those who are in this region and farther afield who use the bridge, significant construction is set to begin in 2018 as the process for procuring the private sector partner is very close to being finalized. And once complete, this vital and strategically important bridge will feature six lanes, two ports of entry, direct connections to highway systems in Canada and the US. And of course, only the government of Canada would name a uh, bridge for a hockey player, but he was a proud Canadian who led the Detroit Red Wings to four Stanley Cups. Um, in conclusion, I'll just summarize my comments today by saying we must never take our economic ties in North America for, America for granted. Our mutual prosperity depends on partnership. Since 1994, the world has changed. Our work, our economies, our lives have all evolved. Now we have an opportunity to make sure our agreements evolve as well, to reflect those changes. Although gaps remain, we're making really good progress. And Canada believes that a fair agreement that benefits all three NAFTA partners is possible. And we will continue to play a proactive and constructive role in these talks putting forward proposals as a way to bridge gaps. We remain committed to finding a win-win-win solution that creates jobs and contributes to our competitiveness as a region. Canada's objective is a good agreement. It's a good agreement, not just any agreement, and we're working tirelessly to achieve it. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Merci. Gracias. Back to you, Paul. I'd like to. Yeah, yeah. For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Angel Ramirez. He is Director of Trade and Investment Commission for the Eastern Midwest US for Pro Mexico, based in Detroit. And Pro Mexico is the official Mexican government agency to promote exports and foreign investment. His office covers the states of Indiana, 
south of Illinois, the south of Illinois, Kentucky, Michigan, and Ohio. And their mission is to strengthen Mexico's ex exports and foreign direct investment. Angel joined ProMexico in 2013 with the opening of the Detroit office. He's got 11 years of experience in the private industry, working in the plastics industry uh, for Tupperware. And he also worked the international end of the auto industry in Mexico. Thank you very much for joining us today, Angel. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the introduction. And also, I want to thank uh, the IDDC for putting this seminar together. And we'll continue on the same notes. Uh, let me put up a little perspective, perspective on the uh, Mexico's perspective and plans on the NAFTA renegotiations that started last year, as Council George mentioned. And uh, let's take you from there. Well, uh, as we have uh, already mentioned, uh, NAFTA has been beneficial to to all three countries. Uh, if we, we all recall when NAFTA was signed, or at the moment was a very a little bit of controversial uh, because it was the first trade agreement of its class. And what I meant is that it was a first trade agreement at the moment that it did, didn't include uh, nations that were viewed as equally developed. So it was viewed as like a challenge or that it might not work because it was involving Mexico, a uh, developing country that way it's considered and the US and Canada. But after all, it, it was a complete opposite of a failure. And most of the models of free trade agreements over the world have been a model after NAFTA. And like Consul just mentioned, uh, is NAFTA has worked so well that we are in the need of uh, not fixing it, but making it better because of the changes that have happened in more than 20 years. Um, and because we can always uh, improve forward. Uh, the negotiations of this uh, approach that we want to do, it's definitely Mexico's position is the same as Canada. We want it to be trilateral. and always have a win-win approach. That's what it's called uh, an agreement. All three parties have to be, uh, uh, to have equal and great benefits to all three countries. We support the updating, modernizing this agreement we want free trade to continue. After NAFTA was signed, Mexico, as many know, uh, has become a free trade uh, agreement champion. Uh, we have uh, around uh, access to 46 different countries with uh, free trade agreements. Uh, we've been keen in adding new provisions to the agreement, of course, such as those related to energy, innovation, uh, helping the small and medium-sized businesses many that can benefit from the pact that probably didn't benefit as well in the first inception of NAFTA. Like we've been saying, we can always make it better. Promoting new environmental, light, labor, uh, gender initiatives, uh, et cetera. The, the ways to update and make it better are basically endless. Um, however, there's some things that we, uh, Mexico, cannot accept. Uh, and we will not uh, sacrifice any benefits or put anything in jeopardy just because of short-term politics. Let me explain you a little bit of how this impact that Mexico has ranked in the U.S. economy, basically after NAFTA was signed. So to this, in this, in this graph, the, the states in green, basically more than 15% of their total exports, uh, Mexico is their first uh, trading partner, and you can go on from other states, but as you can see, uh, basically, most of the states and their main production, and even some of the states that are not highlighted, uh, have benefited uh, largely from the from the trade pact. Mexico is basically for all the states one, two, three, ranking uh, for exports uh, of of the main of their main exports, regardless of the of the commodity. Almost five million jobs in the U.S. depend on uh, the commerce of goods and services and jobs with Mexico. Council you already mentioned the ones with with Canada. Uh, and in some cases, uh, even more than a uh, hundred million jobs uh, in the inside the states market in blue. Uh, traditionally, people might think that well, not uh, just beneficial, it's just involved with states in the southern border of the, of the U.S. But no, as you can say, it's completely quite the opposite. Uh, basically, everyone is involved, and uh, it is the same for uh, for the states that are not completely highlighted. But it's still, there's all even if people don't realize what everything has to be. And it's related to trade. 
uh, on the opposite side, uh, uh, as the companies in the US and Canada have expanded, like Consul just mentioned, to expand and get new markets and get good products at home. Well, Mexico has done their part on investing in the US. Mexican companies, as they are completely, since NAFTA was uh, they started, have invested more than 6,500 businesses in the US, making them directly employ more than 120 million workers. And not only also, uh, you know, acquisitions of companies, so big Mexican groups, you know, like uh, uh, Bimbo Group that makes the, the bakery that has made some great huge investment of even acquisitions of American companies to keep them growing and to make it modern. And in the map, you can see the density of where all those Mexican companies have been mainly located and where they create jobs, 100% US jobs, you know, a couple of uh, uh, general management positions, of course, but they are American entities owned by Mexican companies generating U.S. jobs. And we need to fight perceptions during this negotiation. That's what we believe, uh, especially because uh, NAPA has probably done been a, a good war or been used with a political, uh, uh, try to get a political benefits, uh, and especially in manufacturing towns of jobs, you know, that, uh, the, the decline of manufacturing positions in the, in the Midwest area that I oversee, uh, is, is, it, it has happened, uh, but it, not for the reasons that many people believe. 87% uh, of the jobs were lost during these uh, last 25 years have been lost due to automation, uh, not because of free trade. Uh, and this is just continuing going to happen, and that's a, a, a different issue, but, uh, we as a country need to be prepared for that. Uh, we, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about the auto industry and this approach because of the area I serve. And in this case of this office, we serve as uh, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and Kentucky, a lot of auto production and auto suppliers. Uh, we want to, of course, be sure that we never lose focus uh, that we need to set rules for a long-term perspective. As everybody that has been around the industry, you know that it's not uh, policies that can be changing every year, uh, especially during the duration of planning of the platforms. Uh, current, and as everybody knows, or most people know, the NAFTA will content rule of origin is currently set at 62.5 for finished vehicles, a little bit lower in some components. Um, and it will be difficult to to fulfill if it is not done right. Uh, we are willing to explore how to strain those rules of origin for sure. Uh, if they can be higher, they can be higher. Sometimes they will be lower and be lower, but of course, always to make the good for the industry. Uh, currently, uh, back to the auto industry rules of origins, if we compare it to other uh, uh, trade agreements, NAFTA, as it stands right now, is the highest one of the other free trade agreements in the world. Uh, as we can see in the initial proposal, that it was 85% for NAFTA 2.0, and in some cases, 50% uh, is in, in the first uh, suggestion by the US, up to 50% of US, US content. Uh, it, will, it will not be beneficial for the, for the industry right now. Uh, the current proposals that have been negotiating, as Consul just mentioned, even though it seems that the negotiations apparently are not going anywhere, and just the contrary, the opposite, many of the chapters have already been closed. And there's have been a lot of advances, even in the auto uh, industry sector. In the current proposals, for depending on these being broke by components, more than a, in a finished vehicle, some of the components have been up to 75%, like uh, engines, for example. And other components up to stay in the 62.5 percent for some other some kinds of of sub assemblies and for mexico as, as i already mentioned we, we are after nafta and we saw it when the benefits of free trade we completely changed up our, our uh, economic uh, development plan to basically uh, strengthen our presence in mexico in the world by free trade so our plan to complete uh, to continue is com our commercial di diversification in the rest of the world. Uh, if, since NAFTA renegotiations renegotiation begin, we already may completed that along with Canada in the integration of the TPP-11 uh, without the U US. 
we have also just modernized our free trade agreement with the European Union that it was not as old as NAFTA, it was around 15 to 18 years old, but it was also modernized. And of course, the Pacific Alliance that we have with Chile, Colombia, and Peru, and try to deepen our current agreements that are not free trade, but it can, be, can become a free trade at any time with Brazil and, and Argentina. Uh, the proposed change we agree with uh, with with, the, with our Canadian counterparts that uh, we need to uh, to keep the the arbitration panel that it's it has been worked and in in most of the cases if not all whenever it has to be uh, used and and, and fix a, 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 any, any problem it has favor even to the U.S. Uh, this uh, uh, panel creates certainty. Uh, same thing with the sunset with the sunset clause that is being proposed. Um, indeed, Mexico's counter proposal is that we are we agree that we can probably set a, a time to review the, the the trade agreement every specific amount of years. So we end up with at the end with a twenty something you know, year treaty, but not terminating because this will create the opposite of uh, of, of of stability and confidence to the investors or to the companies to make funds in the region. And it will, and in most in the cases, we will drive investment away. Now, we're currently waiting to hear back uh, from the US to continue the negotiations. Uh, Mexico is willing and want to make the agreement better. Uh, if, if the US needs to pull the agreement, Mexico will, will like, like I mentioned in my past life, will diversify into new markets, but we will definitely wait and close the deal whenever we have to close it, uh, whenever it's beneficial for everything, and we won't rush it if for neither for neither Mexico selections or U.S. selections. And just quick, just to finish a little bit, uh, even though I don't have a slide for that because it's relatively new, on the 232 tariffs and steel and aluminium, uh, we're basically doing the same as, as Canada. We will be making some challenges at the WTO, and we already announced that we will also impose dollar to dollar tariffs and mainly in, uh, in pork uh, products, uh, bourbon, apples, uh, blueberries, among others. Uh, and those will only stay after uh, as long as the uh, uh, aluminum and, and the steel tariffs stay. Uh, for any questions, uh, this is our, our content information. We are here in, in Metro Detroit in Madison Heights. Uh, well, thank you very much. We'll be happy to uh, ask any questions. Again, thank you much to the IEDC for setting this up. And Paul, uh, I'll turn it back to you to continue with the next uh, panelist. Thank you very much, Angel. Um, as Angel, you know, proved, um, he, Consul General George of Canada, their colleagues, uh, both at their offices in Detroit and across the U.S. They are great friends of the U.S. and they value growth in the U.S. and international trade uh, with the U.S. Um, those people that uh, tend to think that the U.S. is in a fight against Canada and Mexico, uh, they should realize what friends we have in the Canadian and Mexican government. So thank you very much, Anel. Joining us next is Dan Ucho of the law firm Dickinson Wright. He is the practice group chair for Dickinson Wright's innovative Canada, US, and NAFTA platforms based in Columbus, Ohio. Dan is the president of the Ohio Canada Business Association. He also serves on the board of the American Chamber of Commerce and on the board of the, the Woodrow Wilson Center's Canada Institute and the North American Strategy for Competitive organization known as NASCO. He frequently testifies before U.S. state and Canadian government agencies, and his commentary can be found in various media all over, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, U.S. News, World Reports, Bloom, Bloomberg News, even the Globe and the Mail, the CBC, and the Business News Networks. Dan, I turn things over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you for the kind and uh, generous introduction. And uh, just in the interest of time, I don't want to give short shrift on the introductory comments, but thank you to IEDC. Uh, I don't think anybody can argue IEDC fails to provide up-to-the-minute webinars, uh, given the fluidity of this situation. And it is a privilege to be here with a distinguished co-panelist. I'll just say um, that not only is it professionally rewarding, but personally fulfilling when you can do these with friends, which uh, 
all of us on the line are. Uh, Dickinson Wright, uh, I'll, I've styled as now 19 or never, meaning 2019, and I'll move at the quick step here, but uh, as, as Paul mentioned, Dickinson Wright um, has longstanding experience and expertise. The firm was headquartered in Detroit uh, back in the 1870s. Our offices in Canada actually predate that, so while we've been doing Canada-US since the 1860s and 1870s, we've been doing North America uh, via Mexico from the 1950s and 1960s, and we operate in the key North American trading corridor. So the perspective I'll offer today is from the ground up, uh, but we do uh, work very closely and are very privileged to have relationships with so many of the public and private sector and everything in between economic development organizations. And since we will be moving at the quick step, if there are any ways that you need additional information or talk, please don't hesitate to reach out for me. Again, we work frequently with our EDOs and site selectors all over the United States and Canada and Mexico and around the world, and happy to always uh, devote our time and attention to, to you because our, our, we're still one of the top five fastest growing law firms and our success model is very simple. Uh, if our clients are growing, we are, and that means working with our economic development professionals. Turning to the NAFTA, there's been a lot of what I call the letter people. I have a seven-year-old, so that's actually our collection of the letter people there, uh, or uh, alphabet soup. We, we hear the objective, of course, is win-win-win, as the Consul General eloquently stated, but we've also heard allegations in the W's of winner-take-all, or how do we just find a win to prevent uh, withdrawal? We've heard NAFTA next, which would be a new NAFTA. We've heard talk of a no NAFTA or no NAFTA at all. Uh, some, we've called it a naughty NAFTA, not as in you're a bad NAFTA, but uh, we may end up with a solution where the NAFTA is a little bumpy or not, and some have called that a zombie NAFTA. But the framework that I would offer you today is to really think of things in the, in the world of three T's. Everybody wants to know number three, the targets and topics. How will this impact me? But those targets and topics are shaped by the tone and tenor of these discussion, really the politics, and we see a lot of that. It's the Twitter of the day, uh, if you will, and of course, the timing and tempo. Um, let's face it, uh, we, since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement in 1988, uh, we have not in the United States ratified a trade agreement in an election year, except for three uh, of a, basically about 20. So it's tough politics. The last time we did it was in 2006, and we said we'd never do it again. We also have elections in Mexico on July 1st. We have two provincial elections in Canada. So the timing and tempo of this is very tricky. Indeed, Leah Dickinson Wright put out a piece in February of 2017 saying if we hit every deadline and agree on everything, it will be very difficult to get this done before May of 2018. And certainly that has not been the case. And now, of course, we have a new tea with tariffs, as both Angel and the Consul General stated. Um, so let's just take very quickly a look at the timing and tempo. Uh, it's a little bit like a Justin Timberlake song that goes around, comes back around. Uh, we started this out talking about tearing it up, you know, that there would potentially be a withdrawal from the NAFTA. Then, of course, there, is a, uh, there was an option of tweaking it. The NAFTA, so many of you heard throughout 2017, likely signed on the letters of do no harm. And now that's called a skinny NAFTA. The NAFTA actually has a provision in it that allows us to modify it. We've used it depending on how you count about a dozen, dozen and a half times. Uh, the challenge with a skinny NAFTA is there's only certain things you can do. You can't make major changes. In fact, some of us which exist, you can't put in, for example, a digital chapter. You can't make some of the major upgrades. So that's one of the challenges. And of course, both for policy and political reasons, the administration has wanted to do something bigger, a full-scale review. And to do that, you have to invoke what's known as trade promotion authority. The last trade promotion authority, otherwise known as fast track, uh, was that done back in 2015 to try to get the TPP through Congress, and that's the one we're using today. And then, of course, over recent days, the last 36 hours or so, we've heard um, a phrase is that we're going to twin the NAFTA, that, uh, uh, or perhaps pursue two parallel bilateral deals, and I'll talk more about that at the very end uh, today. Just a quick note, since we are using TPA 2015, it's also known as Fast Track, but let me emphasize, there's nothing fast about it. It does expire on June 30th. The president has asked for an extension. Uh, the statute allows for an extension. That extension has to be granted by June 30th. Now, Congress doesn't have to say yes, because when we passed that legislation, we knew it'd be an election year in 2018. So we didn't want to make members of Congress uh, go on the spot. But Congress, the, all they have to do is not say no. But they can pass a disapproval resolution. So one of the things to keep an eye on over the last, the next few weeks is, is Congress going to flex its muscle on trade? 
Uh, we see some legislation, Senator Corker and others. It doesn't look like that's going to pass, but what we may see is a backroom deal where Congress allows the Trade Promotion Authority to continue, not only for NAFTA, but if the administration wants to pursue a deal with Japan, the UK, if that ever gets worked out over there, um, in exchange for not withdrawing from the NAFTA or elsewhere. So that's something to keep an eye on. The TPA, as I've included a chart here, no reason to look at this, I'll, I'll summarize it, but it's for your files. Um, but there's four phases. Phase one, phase one is everything we did in 2017 before the negotiations started. And the whole idea is to have a very transparent process. Phase two is the phase that we're in right now, which are negotiations, which requires a consultation with Congress. Keep in mind, any member of Congress can request a meeting with the U.S. Trade Representative, but the reality was Congress really didn't care about what was going on in NAFTA until about the fall, because they were doing health care reform earlier in the year, and even in the fall, they were focused on tax reform. So the reality is Congress really didn't wake up to NAFTA until 2018. They can pass a disapproval resolution if they feel they haven't been consulted, highly unlikely. There's also notices that need to be filed if you're touching sensitive topics like trade remedies. Um, and the way it worked out, really, when you started doing all the math, is we were not able to get a deal done before the end of March because of the way the various timelines work. And quite frankly, we needed to get a deal done by the end of March if we wanted to hit uh, that June 30th timeline. So the, the real world reality is if we don't get an extension on TPA, this is over. Um, so just keep that in mind, and, and I would suggest in some ways it is over. But, um, so we, but what happens now? If the parties wake up today and get an agreement, the next step in this process is that Congress has to give, or excuse me, the White House has to give the president 90 days notice of the agreement. Within 30 days of that, publish the text. Um, so just do the math really quickly. All of that is past June 30th, that timeline, and all of that is past July 1, the Mexican election. Uh, let's, and so there are some questions. What is an agreement in principle? We also will see, is Congress going to start flexing? There's a lot of things going on right now. And then if we move into the next phase, there are various reports that need to be filed, economic impact, labor impact, et cetera. In short, there's a lot of things that have to be done before it even gets to Congress's desk. In the fourth phase, then they have 90 days to pass it, and that would be right smack dab in the middle of an election or the lame duck. Uh, keep in mind, we have never passed a trade deal in the lame duck session, and along the way, we also have provincial elections, elections in Ontario today, the Mexican election, we have primary elections, Quebec has election in October, we have our U.S. elections and the Canadian federal elections. Summarizing all of that means it's highly unlikely that this deal will get done and ratified through in 2018. Now, moving forward, and just very quickly in my remaining time, what's in it? The targets and topics. The targets and topics, President Trump used the phrase renovation. Um, and I thought there was no better phrase than a former real, that a former real estate mogul term president can use. The renovation that we're doing on the NAFTA has one, an area where we're just putting on fresh coat of paint, two, where we're putting in new fixtures and upgrades, and three, what the, we've called, where we're actually knocking down walls, what the U.S. Trade Representative calls rebalancing, what the U.S. Chamber has called poison pills. Um, just very quickly, there is a lot of work done on the fresh coats of paint. Um, you can see there's chapters on small and medium-sized enterprises, anti-corruption. There is some good news for those of you that have food processing, food safety companies, telecom, environment, a lot of nice upgrades coming in on chemicals and food patents. So if you need more information on those, happy to discuss. Then we, of course, are making major upgrades on digital on the digital chapter, uh, a new border chapter, which uh, has been reported to be the platinum standard uh, in trade to really help on customs processing and removing red tape. And of course, energy dealing with um, um, the, particularly the Mexican energy reforms. All of those have one or two issues left, but they're getting held up by the walls. Uh, we started out hearing from both the Consul General and Anhal about the automotive rules of origin. Textiles, nobody's talking about this one, but it's really important for those of you that have retail or folks, anybody that's stitching anything together, there are big changes being proposed in the NAFTA on textiles. Um, supply management with the dairy, egg, and poultry in Canada, a very controversial issue if we're touching that. Labor issues are still out there, although those are getting rolled into the automotive rules of origin proposal. Dispute resolution, I'm not going to get too much into dispute resolution because it gets into trade nerd world, but I'm happy to talk about that during the question. Agricultural issues with Mexico's uh, seasonal growers, by american issues, and of course the sunset clause. As I wind down here, I just, and then there's a litany of others, intellectual property rights. Um, one thing I do want to flag on this list is 
Um, there's a lot of reporting both sides. Unfortunately, we're not going to get a fix on North American immigration in these discussions. The positive step is we're also probably not going to see the NAFTA visa or anything blown up. There are arguments for and against on both sides, but I just don't think it's going to be a huge issue on this. I do note, though, if for some reason the NAFTA, with, that we do see a withdrawal of the NAFTA, NAFTA visas go away. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, I just want to drill down a little bit on the automotive rule of origin. As Angel said, and the original U.S. proposal was to go from 62.5 to 85% value content, 50% of that from the United States in a one to three year phase and then some changes in other rules. In April, the U.S. came back and said, instead of 85, let's make that 75. But as the Consul General highlighted, a 70% rule for steel, aluminum, and glass must be from North America and most controversially added a North American average wage. That when you look at the final assembly of the vehicle, 40% of that for passenger cars, 45% of that for light duty trucks needs to be made with wage at the North American average wage, which is roughly uh, 15 to $17. And of that, only 15 to 20% can be R&D marketing, basically the engineers at the tech center. So at the end of the day, roughly two thirds of the folks that are putting these things together on the line need to be paid at least 7, 15 to 17 an hour and different phase-ins for components. Um, I do note that there is a fairly long phase-in of nine years for those in the autonomous vehicle, elect electric vehicle perspective. Mexico, there is a typo here. This was Mexico's response to that. Mexico said instead of 75, how about 70? Instead of 70% of steel, how about 30 and 20? And on the North American average wage, instead of 40, 45, how about 15, 20 and everything counts in a 10% phase or 10 year phase in. Um, the US immediately rejected that proposal and we've basically been in past ever since. And so that has led us to the politics. We all see how the politics are playing out and I don't wanna take our time today commenting too much on that. Uh, we're, and of course, it's really dependent on what's happening here. Uh, I hate the phrase, the Rust Belt, we consider it an insult, those of us from Ohio, Michigan and elsewhere. But of course, the, the political battlegrounds here are very important. Let me just conclude here and say what's happening. The procedural and political calendars are closed to see a deal ratified in 2018. I do think, so we're, we're looking at 2019. I do think there may be an attempt at a quote unquote agreement in June or July with an effort to get rid of the um, 232 steel and aluminum tariffs, agreeing in some type of principle that we agree that a certain percentage of steel and aluminum must be in the vehicle. I'd watch for something like that. I don't think we'll see a skinny NAFTA. A lot of talk now about pursuing bilateral deals. Uh, one with Mexico, one with Canada. But if you look at the language being used, it's a bit different than what we saw or this time last year. Um, the president isn't talking about withdrawing from NAFTA. What he's talking about is dealing separately with Canada and separately with Mexico. So the idea would be you still have a trilateral deal, but different agreements with the two parties. So that's more about tactics than some type of transformative uh, approach. The tariffs are out there. Of course, we have been since launched an investigation into uh, foreign imports of automobiles. That report is expected to be done by the end of October. So all of these things. And Canada and Mexico both are in political season as well. And the get tough strategy is out there. I think we're in very real danger of punching ourselves into the corner here. So again, I think we can look at a late June or July deal um, on auto rule of origin, but if not, um, we're going to look at something like an agreement, maybe sometime this year, uh, but not ratified into 2019. Then you get into the Canadian politics. So we may be looking at 2019, 2020, or maybe never, um, which is, so I would say my money slide is I think we'll see 70% chance of some type of an agreement to deal with the steel and aluminum tariffs, and then we'll continue negotiating. I think there may be a chance they try to do a quick deal, but I think the political pushback on that in Ohio and Michigan and elsewhere makes that highly unlikely. And there's always the the 10% that we'll see a withdrawal from the NAFTA between the midterms because that's just the Twitter factor. Um, and here's the real problem. If we don't do something on NAFTA, here's a slide that goes from a long time ago that shows after 9-11, we passed a series of security measures and we saw the North American economy dip. But you can also see that the North American economy really tapped out in 2000. Why? We've needed a new NAFTA for a really long time. And so the longer we stay in status quo, that gives the rest of the world more time to catch us and perhaps surpass. Lastly, 
so your, co your companies that you're working with need to be uh, abreast of this. They need to be making sure that they know what, what products are in their supply chains. They need to make sure their certificates of origin. Why? Not only for regulators, but the big OEMs now are going down the supply chains and saying, hey, how much are you paying for labor? How are your certifications up to date? And I can tell you because we're drafting those surveys that are going out for the OEMs. And if companies don't have that information, they're going to get bounced out of the supply chain. And as you all know, once you're bounced out, it's really tough to get back in. We also are telling all of our clients to renew, renew, renew all certification, immigration, just in case this thing gets bumpy and stay involved. Uh, this isn't going away. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions during the session. Back over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Dan. And I, I recommend that uh, Dan had a tremendous amount of information um, in his presentation that when you do receive these presentations from the IEDC, do review that and keep it. It's a great cheat sheet to have of what is going on currently in terms of NAFTA. Our next speaker is Stephen McKenzie, who is CEO of the Windsor Essex Economic Development Corporation, which is a not-for-profit economic development agency for the Windsor and Essex region of Ontario, Canada. He spent 23 years in the economic development organizations in Connecticut, Nova Scotia, and now Ontario. He's worked closely with site selection consultants and corporate end users from around the world and has managed all aspects of business attraction as well as business retention and expansion efforts and projects. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Paul, and uh, again, thank you uh, to IADC for inviting me to participate in this uh, very important topic. Um, so the, the, the presentation today, the, the webinar, takes a bit of a turn today at this point because you've heard from uh, Council General George, you've heard from Angel with ProMexico uh, about the company, uh, country positions uh, for the two other uh, countries involved. You've heard Dan talk about a lot of the, the process and, uh, and legal ramifications. And then uh, now myself and David will, uh, will give you uh, sort of a where the rubber hits the road. What, what do these things mean to our companies and what are we hearing from our companies now? So uh, we'll dive right into that. Please bear with me uh, on the first couple of slides um, because uh, in order to really demonstrate uh, the impact for our companies, it's important to give you a little information about our region. It's not meant to be a, a pitch for our region by any stretch, but uh, to, to show you it helps to shape the geography and the industry makeup show. So as you can see, Windsor-Essex on this slide, um, we are uh, uh, pretty far south. Uh, in fact, we are the farthest uh, uh, point south in Canada. And in fact, uh, Detroit, uh, it, we are actually uh, south of Detroit, believe it or not. Um, I throw other departments up there to go through quickly just to indicate because of our industry mix and because of our location, one of our um, departments. We actually have an Institute for Border Logistics and Security. It's, it's that important. Um, we are a binational region. I mean, this is a, a real photo. No, uh, no touch-ups uh, on the left. Uh, some of you may recognize Detroit, uh, the big uh, dark buildings there. That's General Motors uh, headquarters. Uh, and on the right side, uh, Windsor. So it is uh, a binational region. Uh, so any policies that are made uh, and any rules that have to be enforced, um, they are happening here, at least uh, for, for the Canada and the U.S. portion. A little bit about uh, the, the, the region. Um, a couple, there's a typo on this. We're actually, we, we are the busiest commercial border crossing and trade quarter in North America. There's no question. We actually currently have four uh, surface crossings between Canada and the U.S., but there are six, uh, i.e. two more on the horizon. The Gordie Howe International Bridge that uh, Council George mentioned, and there's also the owners of the Ambassador Bridge are, uh, have received approval to build uh, a second bridge there. So there may even be as much as six. But more importantly, $450 million in goods cross uh, the, the border every day, which represents a full one quarter of all trade, both two-way trade between Canada and the U.S. And again, a little note to show that we are um, uh, pretty far south. In fact, uh, I believe the stat is there are 13 states, either full or part of the state, and 50 million Americans live north of where we're operating and where we exist. Uh, and that is, you know, it's, it's uh, when you think that Canada has 33 million people to begin with, that's, uh, the, you know, there's more 
Americans live north of us than the entire population of our country. So a little bit on the clusters. Uh, you've heard a lot about it. Auto, advanced manufacturing and agriculture, some of the key ones. And again, uh, it's no surprise they're, they're key ones for us as we go through. Um, manufacturers, uh, OEMs, we have FCA and Ford. We have the machine tool die mold structure. And you can see, uh, you can see how important that is. Uh, on the right there, that's actually a photo from uh, Fiat Chrysler Canada. That's the Chrysler Specifica uh, in production there. Also greenhouses, uh, huge, uh, uh, agriculture is a huge uh, one of our sectors and 75% of our production is exported, so extremely important. So what does this mean? You know, what's happening? Um, it's been mentioned a little bit, but uh, the integrated supply chains, you know, for NAFTA, love it or hate it, um, we're dealing with the facts. And in fact, Canadian auto parts companies employ more people in the U.S. and Mexico combined than they do in Canada. Uh, so, as I say, it's not like uh, like jobs moved here. Uh, you know, we're creating jobs in, in other parts. Uh, the the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association um, reports that Canadian auto parts makers employ 86,000 people at 270 facilities. So, just to back that up, one of the interesting things again, a picture of the Chrysler Pacifica, and this is a quote from uh, from FCA. Um, that to demonstrate the integrated supply chain, we have uh, some of the parts go back and forth seven times across uh, the Canada-US border uh, to the different vendors and, and suppliers, tier, tier three, two, one, uh, before they are installed. And so, uh, you know, at what point do some of the rules that Dan mentioned and that, and that the other speakers have mentioned come into place? When is it uh, US content? When is it Canadian content? I mean, it's gonna be really, uh, the devil is in the details on this, just uh, as it usually is. Um, one of the points that we emphasized, and it was brought up a little bit, is because of the nature of our region, more than 6,000 people that live uh, on the Windsor-Essex side commute to Detroit daily, uh, or to Greater Detroit for work, and our surveys show about 600 folks that live on the Greater Detroit side commute here for work. So. Uh, one of the big concerns and, and what we're starting to hear from, from our companies, of course, is make sure that, uh, that labor um, and the, and the uh, uh, credentials for, for business persons and professionals are maintained and improved. Um, so what are our companies saying? Uh, that's what this is about. Uh, just give us the rules. Uh, the uncertainty of renegotiations with these creates an incredible trepidation for investment and expansion. Uh, and it stifles investment. People are, are waiting and seeing. They want to invest, but they're not uh, doing it. And in fact, at the uh, yesterday, the, the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada had their uh, annual event. And uh, one of the keynote speakers was Joseph Heinrich. He's the executive vice, pre executive vice president and president of global operations for Ford. And when asked and put the question to him, when he was on a panel, you know, what do you think of all this NAFTA? He goes, Ford advocates for certainty. He goes, quite simply, we are a highly capital intensive business and we have long products, product cycles. So they, they want certainty so that they can make intelligent investments. Uh, again, we talk about the, uh, the cross border, how the culture has changed a little bit um, and, and, and how it's traveled. And they say, you know, we really need to update the rules. One of the things that companies in our region emphasize is it's not an immigration issue, it's an economic issue. What other concerns do our companies have? Uh, any thickening of the border will have a negative impact on the trade figures, uh, and any delay at the border can be viewed as added border tax. Um, so, uh, if, 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 as I said, it's there, you know, a lot of talk about tariffs these days, with the 232 tariffs, but uh, creating delays uh, provides and adds cost to the whole process and it's the equivalent of a, of a, of a tariff. So you have to be careful with that. Current, the, the movement again, back to employees, it's the, the movement between the two countries is fraught with delay and confusion. Um, you know, update that. Everybody realizes we need to update um, some of the professional credentials. There's jobs that exist today that didn't exist back when this was originally done. Um, I think uh, one of the early speakers mentioned this, the potential of driving the, the OEMs out of the NAFTA countries to lower cost countries. It's important to realize that, you know, that Canada, US and Mexico don't exist in a vacuum. It's not a zero sum game between the three countries. Uh, if, if, there are, 
if, if regulations are put in place that, that increase costs, then, then there are other countries, low cost countries, India, China, uh, that will gladly take the production. And uh, again, I'll quote Joseph Heinrichs from Ford when he, when he said, you know, you have to remember, and he was talking about Ford, but it really applies to a lot of companies. We sell regionally, but we need to compete on a global scale. And, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, that our companies and that uh, our organization wants our, our negotiators and all the parties involved to remember. So we, we actually, because of the importance to the area, we, we actually put together uh, some NAFTA recommendations for uh, our negotiators and it was sent there. Um, but we also put together, uh, they're not in this report, but uh, uh, some coping strategies and Dan started to allude to them. So I'll just go through quickly, but the coping strategies, what do I do if I'm a company or, or from my economic development friends on the line, you know, uh, what do we, what should you advise your companies? Again, assess your supply chain to identify the risks. Um, simple as the question, would import exports still make sense? You've got to explore distribution channels, uh, your customers, supplier bases, internal operations, if you have operations in, in different countries. Um, it's really, really, uh, really important. Uh, for companies continued, um, assess customs programs. One of the things that we've found out, we just recently were named as a foreign trade zone uh, point in Canada. And there were a lot of uh, programs that companies could have already been taking advantage of for uh, because of the way their supply chain works and where work is done that, that, that they weren't. So, you know, there are current programs out there. Make sure you understand, uh, you know, our custom bond to warehouse is something you can use or temporary import permits or duty deferral programs. Um, so we encourage companies to explore that. Um, and again, work to influence policy. I think Dan mentioned this as well. You've got to communicate with government at all levels. You've got to seek uh, allies, companies, trade associations, uh, labor groups, other stakeholders. Get your messages, get your concerns uh, uh, in, into the pipeline so that they can be considered and addressed. Um, Develop a response playbook, a set of actions to address the risk and maintain your competitive advantage. You know, start to map out your scenarios uh, and see, you know, which ones uh, uh, might not cause problems and which ones might be uh, might be just incredibly uh, impact your operations negatively. Um, and of course, monitor negotiations and, and update the contingency plans. Uh, for negotiators, again, I'd mentioned the NAFTA working group. You know. Let's deal with the, with the facts. Uh, there seems to be a lot, and, and, and full disclosure, I am a dual citizen, I hold Canada and US uh, citizenship, um, uh, lived and worked in both countries and also lived and worked in Europe. So, um, you know, something like that, and we have to deal with the facts. Please, uh, my, my advice to folks and companies and economic developers is, is wade through the rhetoric and, and, and get to the facts from the trusted sources. Um, recognize the importance of the interdependence. You've heard the statistics before. It's, it's remarkable the growth that we've had. Uh, for our region, of course, we, we emphasize in that our automotive sector is a key priority, as it is for the other countries. Um, again, one of the key areas that, that we've been emphasizing, just because of the nature of our area, is protect the mechanisms that propose, pro, promote cross-border labor mobility. Very important. A lot of you hear a lot of talk in a lot of areas and companies concerned about the actual trade and the movement, but we have labor, uh, extraordinary amount of labor movement in our region as well. Um, and we thought that increasing opportunities for cross-border experiential learning for uh, students in, in all three of our countries would be a way to uh, provide that crucial education. You know, what are the real facts? Uh, what, what can we do uh, to understand uh, trade movement, supply chains, and of course the international dynamics. Um, and the last one is pretty general, support the region's uh, global economic competitiveness. Of course, you'd, you'd recommend that to, to negotiators. So again, went really quick because I uh, uh, wanted to, to, to uh, keep, keep on track, but uh, if anybody uh, has any questions at the end, happy to answer, but if anybody has any questions that, you know, that might, might uh, pertain to a, specific situation that you didn't want to ask in, in public. I mean, there's my contact information. Uh, happy to uh, to chat with anybody that might have questions. And with that, I'll pass it over to Paul. Thank you very much, Stephen. And, and we here in Northwest Ohio um, have experienced uh, much of what you've mentioned. I, I think in particular, one of the top managers at the Jeep Wrangler production facility here in Toledo commutes every day 
from Windsor to Toledo. Um, so that flow of 6,000 people every day uh, is very, very important. You also mentioned uh, the greenhouse business. And uh, after NAFTA, we've seen a number of Canadian greenhouse operators set up in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and elsewhere, which not only brings jobs and investment, but from what I've learned over the past few years, uh, the Canadians have great technologies uh, for greenhouse operations, uh, which I think they actually borrowed from the Dutch and the Belgians. So not only are we shipping goods and services to each other, but we are collaborating on various yes. businesses and technologies. Yep, agreed, agreed. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Our next speaker is David Kurtenbach who is filling in for David Colligan of the city of Austin. David Colligan was called away to work on a big project, so good for him. David Kurtenbach is the International Program Coordinator for the city of Austin, working in the Economic Development Department. He has a very diverse and strong background in business administration, communications, and international relations, and he is a U.S. Army veteran. David and his teammates in the Global Business Expansion Division at the City of Austin promote exports from the Austin area and promote foreign direct investment into the Austin area. It's a pleasure to have you, David, and I turn things over to you. Great. Thank you for that introduction, Paul, and thank you for everybody at IADC and Delaney for putting this together. And of course, thank you for having me speak. Uh, David Colligan actually is away in Toronto right now, so that just shows kind of the connections that we have between US and Canada there even. Uh, it's an honor to be on the phone and I will go ahead and get started. So uh, what we're really gonna focus on with my presentation is kind of the local uh, type of story that we have here in Austin. So uh, I mean, Austin is the 11th largest city in the US. Uh, we're in close proximity to Mexico, which makes it one of our number one exporting countries as well as importing countries. And we have close ties with Canada as well. Great, okay. So, kind of to delve a little bit more into what Texas has uh, at stake here with its uh, partners in Canada and Mexico is it's, I mean, Texas is uh, the largest exporting state within the United States. So we have uh, NAFTA trade represents nearly half of all exports within Texas and Texas exports more goods than any other state, as I said. Uh, so with Canada, we export or we export around $18 billion annually and import around $22 billion. So these are large numbers with a lot of jobs that are attached to them. And as far as our trade with Mexico, which is significantly more, we do $89 billion in imports and about $97.3 billion in exports. Uh, so basically because of the proximity to Mexico, they're one of our largest trading partners and it's a, a close connection that we've had and fostered over the years. Uh, we're a diverse population and a diverse city. And we try to pride ourselves on that as well as our international expansion and work that we do. Uh, some of the top import industries that we have from Mexico are computer equipment, motor vehicle parts, and communications equipment. Uh, so that's, NAFTA is a large part that kind of plays into that as well. Uh, so kind of just give you a little background story to really understand. I'll just delve into the story of Austin just a little bit for a few slides. If you could just kind of bear with me through it. Uh, so we do 54 million in FDI. 20% uh, foreign-born population, and we have large international activities such as South by Southwest and the Formula One race. Uh, at South by Southwest this past year, we had 95 countries represented from all over the world, and we're always increasing our nonstop flights, uh, many of those going straight to Mexico. So what we do here at the Economic Development Department for the city of Austin is we really focus on those medium-sized businesses that are here in Austin, and they're trying to expand into international markets. So. Uh, a lot of those go into Mexico and a lot of those are going to Canada as well. Uh, and it kind of just creates that cross binational type of agreement that we've been working on so hard. Uh, so to really get an idea of kind of where we sit, uh, the city of Austin and the state of Texas are kind of two different parties, definitely. Uh, there's a disconnect between them and there is at times kind of a bit of tension that I think everyone is a little bit aware about in the city and kind of cautious of. Uh, that being said, though, we are by no means enemies, which a lot of people assume. Uh, we, I mean, if you look at things like Hurricane Harvey or the bombing situation we had in Austin, the city and the state have come together on those. And so along with that, we also take a look at things like international trade and these trade agreements like NAFTA. And we realize the importance that is there for the Texas, for the state of Texas economy, as well as for the city of Austin's economy. Uh, there's a lot 
of good things that are happening and a lot of benefit, uh, which I think a lot of the co-panelists have talked about, is that the numbers do not lie in all of this. You get wrapped up with emotion, but it is really comes down to what those figures are going to say that really drives us home and makes us a logical decision to whether this should be in existence or if it should be modified or if it should be done away with. Uh, so to play a little bit more, uh, obviously Austin, as I've been saying, is a huge trade partner with Mexico. Uh, we had a mayor-led delegation that went to Mexico shortly after the presidential election, and we were the first Texas city to actually have a delegation and have government representation on the ground within Mexico. So it just kind of shows the importance of these relations. And uh, I know as we kind of talk about all these different things that are happening with NAFTA and with trade, if there's also kind of that um, that element of what's the what's the more personal relationship? How is that going to take? I mean, trade and economic development are a big piece of that. And with those opportunities fade away, then those international relations kind of tend to separate a little bit more, which I think is an important element that we really need to consider and that really needs to be talked about uh, when we're starting to look at everything on a holistic view. So to really get into what NAFTA, I think a lot of people have kind of echoed this same message is that it's not going to go away entirely, most likely. Uh, I, you get caught in that feeling of NAFTA is here and NAFTA is not here. It's it's not a it's not a black and white type of line. It's going to be a modified deal, or it's going to be some type of a deal that's going to be put in place, whether it goes by the name of NAFTA or whether it's two separate uh, binational trade agreements between Mexico and Canada. And I think those are the important things to remember. Uh, I feel like a lot of times you just kind of look at the story and you just get this overwhelming urge that, or the overwhelming feeling that. If this goes away, terrible things are going to come, which things are going to change and there'll be a transition period. Yes. And of course, during those times, there's always kind of hesitation and less money flowing, but it, it's not going to end. It's, it's the world's still going to happen and the business is still going to continue between these countries. Uh, I think some of the largest benefits that might possibly even come about from this and renegotiating comes from. Uh, so Austin is a large tech scene, obviously, here within the city that a lot of people are very proud of. And with that, we have the opportunity to really kind of look in to some of the agreements that have been limiting trade within tech and other countries. So some things that hopefully could be looked at and renegotiated within this is the removal of regulations that require localized data centers to be built within countries. So saying that a data center has to be built in Canada and Mexico in order to operate this way, we could maybe re renegotiate those types of ideas, as well as removing a de minimis threshold of Canada that requires a cross-border transaction. Uh, so tech is in the, uh, the tech industry has lobbied a lot for NAFTA because they realize the benefit, which is really one of the largest local effects that we're going to see here, is just because of the overwhelming uh, amount of that industry that's here. But additionally, there's also VR and AR, which are uh, growing sectors within Austin, and those are very hardware-based type of industry and that, that's going to include trade that's going to really need to increase between the between multiple countries and across border. So I think with the trade impact it's really important to realize that NAFTA kind of facilitates these but it's it's not going away again as I said. Uh, the Another concern that I think we really has kind of been expressed is just with the sunset clause. It seems like business is kind of moving in more of a long-term relationship type of deal. And those long-term relationships are, are lasting more than five years. And when you look at the amount of effort that's been put in in just this one renegotiation, you really kind of have to question if we're going to be able to facilitate something like this every five years along the road, along the way, or if we're going to have to find a, a easier way to kind of have this happen, which I think will inevitably come about. Um, these renegotiations are really just kind of a, a trial time right now for everybody to see and I know there's like as I've said there's a lot of emotional impact that's being put into this but when you look down at the numbers you kind of see the benefit of NAFTA and you see that these type of trade agreements are only increasing uh, the the local economies within the US Canada and Mexico so it's only going to continue to keep happening in that way whether it goes by the name of NAFTA or a separate trade agreement so in closing, I'd like to say thank you all very much for your time and attention, and thank you for IDC for putting this on. And if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you very much, David. Um, it was great to see the perspective of people on the ground working with four economic development agencies in Canada and the U.S. with so much going back and forth between U.S. Canada and Mexico. I think uh, one of the points that you made, David, that was uh, very much a wake-up call and reminder to me is that the uncertainty of uh, the status of NAFTA 
and what the U.S.'s position on it is could harm the U.S. very much uh, by having Mexico and Canada uh, and the companies in Mexico and Canada looking at new trade partners and much of the volume of business that is being done between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico could be lost to other countries from Latin America, from Asia, and elsewhere. Um, it's now time for uh, questions and answers. Um, I will check my little system here, but so far I haven't gotten any questions. So to save yourself from the lame questions that I might put up, I highly recommend that uh, someone pose a question. In the meantime, um, I do have some questions. Um, for for Dan Ucho, uh, our, our lawyer on the panel, um, a really twofold question. Um, do you think that NAFTA will implode? Um, if, if, if so, why? And what can we, uh, who work in economic development and international trade, what can we do to support NAFTA and, and to hopefully uh, make it get better and go forward? Uh, thanks, Paul. I, I think the, the likelihood of a withdrawal scenario uh, implode, as you say, is around that 10%. I think the efforts of the economic development community businesses, you know, whether it's uh, as was stated in Austin or Windsor or Detroit, others, um, many, many others throughout the U.S. really demonstrated to the administration that there is a cost to withdrawal. Um, it's not just a negotiating tactic. So I think, I don't think we will see a withdrawal. And I think if we did at that point, we would see Congress get involved uh, and really take the president, it would likely be subject to litigation because it is it is a very unclear issue under U.S. trade law if the president has the authority to withdraw without congressional approval. And I think that would be litigated just given all of the interdependence that we've seen. I think in the immediate term, it is quite important for the economic development community, for the business community to not only continue to monitor, but to put a real face on store on, on trade uh, particularly in the NAFTA region, how this is a vital part of your communities. Um, and I, I'm going to say something somewhat controversial, but look, uh, all of our economic development professionals have political masters as well. In many cases, uh, everybody wants to cut a ribbon. I would really hope our economic development professionals don't use this uncertainty or things like Buy American and others as uh, you know, we don't want to reward bad behavior. Um, and so, uh, you know, we all know that there's opportunities. Companies are looking to expand and hedge their bets, but we want that to be done in a positive way. So I, I would really encourage people not to try to take uh, too much of an advantage of this situation and really look at if we, the, the goal here in the United States, and I think Anhal and the Consul General really hit this point, is to, for better for competitiveness. We need a new modernized NAFTA to make North America competitive, and that'll be the best business attraction tool that you all will have as people look and, and want to site select in the most vibrant economy in the world. If we start having this you know, beggar thy neighbor type policies, it's completely disruptive and we're ultimately gonna lose out in the mid to, to, to long run. So that would be my advice um, just as economic development professionals. But I think the key is to really focus on those companies. This is a real world trilateral trade relationship and make trade real and talk to your policymakers about it. Thank you so much for that advice, Dan. And uh, you know, I'm I'm one of those who tries to be uh, polite all the time and and avoid conflict in social situations. But I think time has come to stand up for free and fair trade. Um, I was very fortunate that uh, two months ago the Heritage Foundation out of Washington, D.C., came to Toledo and did a presentation on their study of how international trade and investment affects Ohio. And I believe they have reports on other states and regions of the U.S. as well. And uh, I will admit my ignorance, I was not that familiar with the Heritage Foundation, and some people think that it's a bit too uber conservative. Um, so I was a little frightened. Um, however, uh, the data that they have provided on the importance of international trade and investment uh, for the United States and how it benefits business owners and workers and families and, and infrastructure, et cetera, um, is very, very unbiased. Um, so if any of you out there are looking for additional uh, ammunition 
uh, to support free and fair trade. Look at what uh, the Heritage Foundation has. Um, I still have no questions. Um, I have one for David Kurtenbach down in uh, Austin, Texas. Um, being so close to a border as you are, David, um, and, and having so much to do with Mexico and with Canada, I'd be curious as to what you hear on the street in Austin from people. Do they support a good NAFTA? Do they want to throw it away? Are they anti-trade? Uh, you know, if the, the, the population of the Austin area as a whole, what's your read on that? Well, I would have to say, unfortunately, a lot of people don't really follow international trade too much. So there's not a lot of talk. But the people who are keen to the conversation are generally concerned. They come at it as this this all or nothing type of uh, argument. And this, they really just, I mean, they see it kind of going a bad way. And their initial instinct is to run away and turn away and see it's a bad thing. And they really want NAFTA to exist because they see that as just the holy grail. Uh, I think kind of as Dan was saying, I mean, there's a 70% chance that something is going to go through and get passed or, and whether it be a modified NAFTA or your binational or two bi binational agreements there. I mean, there's the trade is still going to exist. And I think that's the hardest thing for people to understand right now is that it's not going away. And it's not like the, the borders are going to close up instantly if NAFTA is shut down. Uh, the true importance that kind of comes in is that people just kind of need to get involved in this conversation, I think a bit more and really kind of start talking to their politicians to really get their opinions across and to see things change in a positive way that's going to really help not just uh, Texas, but the entire the entire America in order to really get on a competitive level of trade. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And my recommendation to uh, the participants in this webinar, um, even if you're with a small county or lo local economic development agency, find out what types of international trade and investments are going on in your region, in your state, through the U.S. Department of Commerce or other entities and publicize them. And when you see good data that shows how important exports are and foreign direct investment are to your community, your county, your state, uh, whatever, publicize that so that the man on the street, the woman on the street who may be running by emotion on NAFTA will get a wake-up call and see some of the data that supports uh, international trade and investment in general and NAFTA in particular. Um, we're about out of time. Um, I thank our uh, panelists, Consul General D uh, Douglas George, Angel Ramirez with ProMexico, Dan Ucho with uh, Dickinson Wright, Stephen McKenzie with Windsor Essex Region, and David Kurtenbach um, with the City of Austin. Um, a couple of the takeaways that I will share with you that, that are going to stick in my head for the next few days uh, was the mention of uh, businesses wanting certainty. So I believe one of the panelists said one of the companies has stated, just give us the rules. And, and I see that all the time. Uh, businesses are very resilient. And what may seem draconian uh, uh, measures that may come into a trade agreement, businesses can adapt to that. But they want to know a level of certainty so that they can do their long-term projections and forecasts. I was also very pleased uh, to hear Dan uh, Ucho of Dickinson Wright talk about the time frame of NAFTA negotiations, and it is very complicated, and I certainly can't follow it, um, but I, at least I know now to tell people that probably nothing major will happen um, this year. Um, I was also very pleased, uh, I believe it was David Kurtenbach with the uh, City of Austin, uh, who said that some of the media attention about NAFTA can actually be good because it will get people to get off of their couches and to look at international trade and investment and realize that exports are important to them and their family and their community and that foreign investment certainly is important. And then uh, the last takeaway that, that, that I have that is a bit scary is, is several of the panelists have mentioned that NAFTA friction and then NAFTA uncertainty can drive business out of the NAFTA region. 
those European companies, those Asian companies that are trying to uh, set up operations uh, to uh, manufacture, they may see the uncertainty with NAFTA or the threat of, of NAFTA becoming uh, uh, detrimental to them so that they may place their business elsewhere. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I thank the panelists and IEDC uh, for supporting this effort, and thanks to Delaney Luna and Swati Ghosh of IEDC um, for joining uh, this webinar, um, keeping up with both sides of the NAFTA debate and its global uh, global uh, economic uh, and the global economy. I would like to remind you about an upcoming webinar, The Changing Energy Landscape and Its Impact on Economic Development in America on Thursday, July 26. And finally, as I always do in just about any presentation that I do, um, do support international trade and investment. Um, it's good for you, your communities, your families, your people. And at the end of the day, I always remind myself, myself something that I believe in very much, and that is quite simply, it is possible to get world peace through world business, and NAFTA is an important part of that. Thank you very much.